We'd love to know where we're gathering people to worship online and in person. So it is a good day. The sun is shining. Let's stand up and give God praise. Let's sing.
heavenly Lord, we come to your presence in the unity of faith to ask for the infilling of your power. Without your power, we can do nothing. We pray that your glory radiates in our lives as we live as your ambassadors throughout the days of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. We've got some new members that are going to join this crazy group of people. <laughs> hey, we're fun. I don't know. I had one of these, so I stole Donna. So come on up here, John and Michelle. All right. Uh, the rest of you are going to get out your um, membership insert that's in your bulletin because you, as a congregation, have something to say about these two, too, and some commitments that you're going to make. dissolved, so now we'll bring them into new membership here at this church. And John has lots of SPRC experience. That's Staff Pastor Parrish. That's dealing with the crazy preachers. Yeah, and he still stands today. And <laughs> Michelle sings, don't you? Uh, in, the, in, the, in, a, in a choir, right? Yeah. Yeah, so isn't that exciting? I know. So um, let's start with this. So you guys have this in front of you? All right, so follow along. The Church of God. The church is of God and will be preserved to the end of time for the conduct of worship and the due administration of God's word and sacraments, the maintenance of Christian fellowship and discipline, the edification of believers, and the conversion of the world. Did you know that's what we're supposed to be doing? I know. All of every age and station stand in need of the means of grace, which, is, which it alone supplies. I present John and Michelle Regan for membership. John does not have an H in his name, so don't think I made an error. J-O-N. I'm that good. <laughs> except, except I forgot your certificate, so I have to get you those next week. All right. So now to you. Do you, in the presence of God, in this congregation, renew the solemn vow and promise made at your baptism? I do. Do you truly and earnestly repent of your sins? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? I do. do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to all to people of all ages, nations, and races? According to the grace given to you, will you remain a faithful member of Christ's holy church, and serve as Christ's representative in the world. Okay, congregation. Do you, as Christ's body of the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? Yes. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include those now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround them with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. So you have just committed in front of God that you will pray for them, you will love them, and you will um, learn to forgive, right? Because we're all, we're all about learning that. Okay, as members of Christ Universal Church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? As members of Kingsley United Methodist Church, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? I will. I didn't hear that, John. I will. Okay. <laughs> that means for whatever committee I put you on. <laughs> I will. I will. <laughs> Members of the household of God, I commend John and Michelle to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, 
we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service, and that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. The God of all grace, who has called you to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you in the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Amen and welcome! change my opinion? No, you'd still stick with what was wrong? You would? <laughs> so you would say you're a little stubborn? Except if you have a fight with your brother. But you will change eventually. I, like I said, I used to beat up my brother. He was younger than me. And then one day I punched him and he punched me back and it hurt. And so I never punched him again. And now he's six foot two. And so things change, don't they? Yeah. And so does your, does your sister still pick on you? Yeah, that will change. Yours too? Yeah. So we all, so what about you? Does she beat you? Yeah. No, I don't. Okay, <laughs> just remember, just remember. Oh, and by the way, we're going to have a discussion about karma next week, I'm thinking, because they had a question about karma, and we hear karma, karma, karma. Christians don't usually go down that line of karma, and I'll tell you why later next week so you have to come back because remember we talked about that at the camp out weren't we karma remember we were talking about karma well it's karma they got what they deserve that's karma so we're going to talk about that. even i even heard some adults in the conversation talking about karma so we'll talk about that but back to not changing did you know in the bible it says that jesus is the same yesterday as he is today as he will be tomorrow does that sound as last year, as last year? yeah jesus is the same as last year He's the same as he was before he came to earth. And he's going to be the same today as he is tomorrow. So where's Jesus right now? Do you know? And where is he at? What's he doing in heaven? Hanging out? Yeah. He is seated at the right hand of God with the authority of God. So he had the authority of God in the beginning. He has the authority of God today. And he'll have the authority of God tomorrow. Which means... He's with us yesterday, he's going to be with us today, and he'll be with us tomorrow. So do you think God and Jesus, same person, can change? What do you think about that? Do you think God changes? No. no. What do you think? No. Well, I got a little experiment here. This is bubbles. These are bubbles. Have you seen this? Um, yeah, I have. Really? Yeah. I thought you were going It's supposed to smell like something. I don't scent it, but I don't smell anything. Do you? I, I, feel, I feel like it smells like, I, th I think it smells like strawberry. What shape are these bubbles going to be? Circle. Why? Because this thing is circle. And bubbles always turn circle. Not always. Not always. Not always, like, perfectly. Okay, so, <laughs> that's 
it's a circle. Look, it's sitting there. So here's a heart. What shape do you think this bubble will take? Yeah, I'm going to. Okay. What do you think? A heart. How many of you think heart? It will come out. Yeah. Well, they did it on the TV. Oh, you see it? Yeah, it came out as a circle. Came out as a circle. Hmm. Let me try another one. How about the? How about this thing? Oh no, that is a circle. How about? How about that? That's not a circle. Is it? It's a leopard. It's a four-leaf clover. You use the jalapeno? Okay, I'll try that one. What 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 shape was it? You don't know? No matter what shape, it's always going to be a circle. It's always going to be a circle. So it it's never changes. Easy. It never changes. Even Mr. Lint's circle thing that he does, it might take this weird shape, but then it always ends up to be a circle. It never changes. Did you know that? I didn't. Apparently she did. <laughs> so just like the bubbles, God never changes. God is always the same, which means he will always love us. He will always be with us. He will never change. You can never say that God changes. And there's a lot of people in the world that think God changes. God does not change. Jesus is the same yesterday as he is today as he will be tomorrow. That is biblical and that you can find in the Bible. So that's good news. That's right. Don't you think? Because why is that important? Because when the world's going crazy, what's one thing you can count on? To never change. God. God will never, never, never change. So that's good news. So I know you seem to be bored. Okay. I know you're just tired, aren't you? I'm tired from last, uh, last week. From camping? Man, I was up to uh, 1230 partying. Last summer. Uh, Friday night. Because, um, because. From Lake Ann? It was, yeah, it was the last, by the Lake Ann. So we were partying and dancing on a bunk bed. Wow. It was, it was really fun. Who's your chaperone? That's what I want to know. Okay, so I have fruit juice. I don't know. I can't. Camp. No, no. I can eat all of these. King Dongs again. Ding Dongs. King Dongs. Frosted fudge. Oh, we got these things in here. A little unicorn. <laughs> we got these things. What else is in here? Anything unicorn. Do you want anything there? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> All right, let's 
Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for all these kids. We thank you for how they're growing in their faith, and we thank you for this church that helps to send kids to camp. And for Olivia, we just thank you that she found Christ, and um, I think he was always there, but in a new way, and so I'm thankful for that and thankful for her experience. And now she's going to go out and share. Amen. All right, head on down. Bye-bye. Take your candy. Today's reading is from Matthew 25, 24 to 30. The man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here, in, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will, who, for whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside, into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, God. Sure, you're going to leave me with that? Mm -hmm. Thanks. <laughs> Gravy Jesus, what are you doing to us? Okay, so I'm going to start in prayer because for some reason I am dragging, so I need some prayers. So let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for your word, and we know that your word goes out and always does what it's supposed to do. So I just pray that it does. In the name of Christ. So the leaders here at the church are doing this manual, and it's called Real Life Discipleship. And it really is kind of cool because it's got pictures. And it's got, like, fill in the blanks, and it's got X's and stuff, and answers. And answers. It gives you the answers, so isn't that exciting? So what I love about it is that it gives us an intentional, reproducible process to make disciples. Because what did Jesus give us as a command? Go and sit in the pews and watch other people do the work? <laughs> well, I'm starting this sermon off right. Listen, that was a hard scripture, wasn't it? So, No. Go and make disciples. So that is the command of Christ. And so he will hold us accountable to that. But anyway, so in our readings last week, there was a list of questions that people who are seeking to know more about God will bring to people in the church. That's us. And here's just a few of them. Number one, where did we come from? Why is our world so troubled and violent? Isn't there more than one way to God? Is there such a thing as a moral absolute? Is the Bible an accurate and reliable source of God's truth? What happens after this life? Is hell real? What is the purpose of our lives? So we went through this Monday night, because we're going through this on Monday nights, and um, at least one or two of the days. And after we, I think Julie read the questions, it says... Answer these questions. How would you answer these questions for people that are seeking Jesus? And you know what we heard? Crickets. Crickets. Nothing. We were not, we were not prepared to answer the questions. Now, maybe if I were to give them some time and we were, you know, we were all just sitting there going, uh, how would you answer what is the purpose of life, which is the one I want to talk about today, to someone who comes up to you who is seeking Jesus? If you had one word to tell them, what is the purpose of life? What would it be? Psychology Today asked that question. And here's a couple of answers. This is what the world thinks the purpose of life is all about. Number one, to be successful. To teach us lessons. Life is all about lessons. You learn good lessons and you learn bad lessons. And the bad lessons you learn to not do again, hopefully, right? 
to be happy, to leave a legacy. You know, these are all really good answers, don't you think? I mean, I want to be successful. I want to leave a legacy for my family. I want to be happy, right? I want to learn not just make that same mistake over and over and over again. There's nothing wrong with these answers. But as disciples of Jesus Christ, are you followers of Jesus Christ? Yeah? Our answer to that question, what is the purpose of life, should come straight from the mouth of the master, Jesus himself. This is what Jesus says. The answer is, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. What is the purpose of life? To be faithful. To be faithful to God in a broken world. And let me tell you what, that's going to take some pre-decision, don't you think? So that is what we're doing. We're continuing through our sermon series, Pre-Decide, and we're learning to make quality decisions now so that when situations come up, we already know how we're going to respond to that. Because I want to do a lot more responding instead of reacting. Anybody else? Anybody else? Or am I the only one that reacts? I'm a type A personality. I react. You introverts, this is how you react. I'm just going to go talk about them tomorrow in my work class. And, um, you know, okay? So I'm like, bleh, there it is. Ooh, put that back in my mouth, right? So it. you can't do it. You can't do it. So, so far we've learned to pre-decide to be ready when temptation comes. We're going to build our lives around the framework of Jesus Christ and his value system, God's value system. We've learned to be devoted to God, you know, sticking to it when it gets tough. We've learned to be gracious and generous with the supplies God has given us. And today we're going to learn how to be faithful. Pre-decide some things before we have to make this decision about faithfulness. But I want to talk a little bit about faith. There's lots of scripture in the Bible about God's faithfulness toward us. God has been faithful, right? Would you agree? Even in the Old Testament, was God faithful? You hear people say, God in the Old Testament was a murderer. It was genocide. Oh, no, no, no. God was faithful to his people. His people were not faithful to him. And they turned, and they went and worshipped pagan idols and, you know, golden calves and, you know, Malash and all these other pagan gods and all of this. And so God let go of his protective bubble on the nation of Israel. And guess what happens when you're not protected by God? The enemy attacks and can infiltrate. That's what happened. But God never broke his promise. He promised Abraham he'd be the father of many nations. He was, right? We read that, okay? He promised David that there would always be his lineage on the throne of God's people. And who is Jesus Christ? The king of the Jews, right? The king of the Jewish people and the king of all people, right? So God never was faithless towards us. And so maybe you're thinking, well, I get that. Jesus was faithful. The Holy Spirit is faithful to lead us to all truth. We just sometimes don't listen, right? The, the, the Spirit of God will lead us to truth. The truth is, close your mouth, Colleen, because if you say something, you're going to look like an idiot, right? So then you bite your tongue or you don't. So God has been faithful. But what about us being faithful to God? How do we pre-decide to do that? And then I thought, you know, when you accept Christ in your heart, aren't you already faithful? I mean, it takes faith to believe in Jesus, right? And faith is a gift from God that the Spirit gives us and woos us to Jesus to know who he is, to ask the questions, what is my purpose in life? And hopefully somebody from the church tells them it's to be faithful to Jesus Christ and they start moving forward to that. So we have faith. Do we? Don't we have faith when we believe in Christ? Would you agree? Yeah. I would too. Listen to Galatians 5.22. This is what the Apostle Paul says. But the fruit of the Spirit is, you know them, love, joy, peace, forbearance, or patience, kindness, goodness, say it with me, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So when we believe in Jesus by faith, we get the gift of salvation. Right? We also get the seed of faithfulness. So our faithfulness is a seed. If we want to grow in faithfulness, we have to do some things, don't we? We have to be obedient. We have to follow what God wants us to do. So faithfulness doesn't always come naturally, even though we have faith. Because to believe in Jesus is one thing. 
But to be faithful to Jesus is enough. It should shape the way we look. It should shape the way we act. It should shape our priorities. And that takes pre-decision. So to help us go through this <clears throat> on how to be faithful, pre-decide to be faithful to Jesus, we're going to use the parable of the talents, which is a portion of what Donna read for us. That's a portion where the wicked servant doesn't do what he's supposed to be doing with his bag of gold. So it's the parable of the talents or the gold bags. It's the same parable, okay? Found in Matthew 23. I got to do a little bit of recap on this parable because I think we've heard it differently, preached differently than the way I'm going to preach it today, okay? So it is in response, this parable, along with two other ones, is in response to a question that the disciples asked Jesus in their private teaching time. In Matthew 24, 3, this is what they asked. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So first and foremost, this parable between chapter 24 and chapter 25 is a constant conversation. There's no chapter break there. They just did that. So that you, I don't know, why they put the chapters in there anyway? There was no chapter, right? Jesus is talking, and then he tells the parable about the two servants. Then he tells the parable about the ten virgins, remember? Some of them had their oil lamps ready and were prepared for the bridegroom to come. Some were not prepared. And then he tells the parable of the talents. It's all in response to the question, when are you going to return, Jesus? What will be the time and the hour? When will we know you're going to come back? Because you believe Jesus will come back, right? We just said he was seated at the right hand of the Father. So he's going to come back, right? And when he comes back, he's going to establish his earthly kingdom on earth before the new heavens and the new earth come. So he'll be on earth, okay? So keep that in mind when we're thinking about this parable. Second, Matthew is the gospel writer here. He is Jewish. His you know how Matthew starts, so-and-so is the father of so-and-so in the lineage all the way down to Jesus Christ? He's proving to the Jewish people that Jesus is their Messiah. Okay, so he's writing primarily to the Jewish people, not the church. Although we can take some lessons from this, okay? Matthew places this parable right before the Passover, okay? So this is where he puts it. Remember Jesus said, the Son of Man must go and be crucified and resurrect and then ascend to heaven. Remember he tells this to his disciples before it happened, right? So in other words, Jesus is the master in the parable that goes away on a journey. He goes away. He's in heaven. That's where Jesus is, right? And his return is delayed, right? Because everybody's like, I wish Jesus would just come back. We'd be done with all this, right? Well, he's delayed. This is what he's saying. I'm, I'm the master in this parable. Okay? Goes away on a journey. He journeys to heaven, ascension. So this parable is and affirms the return of Christ. Delayed, but it is certain. And that is why Jesus tells his disciples in Matthew 25, verse 13, Therefore, be alert, because I'm coming back. Because you don't know either the day or the hour. There will be some signs, and we're seeing some of those already, right? We're seeing some of the war, nations, people turning away from God, all of that. There'll be some signs. But you won't know the day or the hour. So when they say, when will this happen? You won't know the day or the hour. But what does he say? Be alert. Be prepared. Do what I've commanded you to do. That is what this parable is all about. What do we do from now until Jesus returns? Sit around and go, boy, I believe in Jesus. It's a good thing. Boy, the world's turning to a heck in a handbasket. Boy, these people are crazy. Right? No, we're supposed to be actively waiting, doing some things. And so we need to be faithful to God now and be responsible with what he's given us before he returns. That's what this parable is all about. Plus, Matthew is telling the Jewish people, this is your Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. Here he is. He's going to go away. Jesus is saying, I'm going to go away, and I'm going to come back. 